a blockchain company, and, uh, and, uh, and we, uh, we write software, mostly in kind of our entire stack is in Haskell or PureScript, we're like functional programmers, and we wrote a lot of libraries that you probably don't use uh, in Haskell and PureScript for dealing with Ethereum specifically. Um, now I work on a different project also for like, Haskell bindings to like to basically Can you speak louder? Yeah. Can you uh, hear me in the back? No. no. I'm literally shouting, so <laughs> close the door maybe. Close the door. Yeah. Um, now I work on a different project, basically like a Haskell bindings to like a ten, you know the Tendermint ABCI socket protocol and a Haskell SDK. Uh, for the like Cosmos network, that's also part of our work, or my work, uh, and some other people in the room. So that's what we do more or less in the talk. Um, we'll try to finish on time. Let us know if at some point you can't hear us in the back, but try to keep the door closed. Okay. So um, yeah, Chris is going to do most of the work. Yeah. Well, all right. So um, as Martin said, uh, this is the presentation is a little bit. Uh, broad. Uh, we have a workshop tomorrow. If you're if you're interested in what we're talking about, you get the chance to use libraries and applications for that specific purpose of bringing people aboard. Um, okay. First, first of all, uh, let's just talk about what do we mean by functional programming. There's it's functional sort of word that's been thrown around a lot. Um, so for us, we basically focus on purely functional languages with strong static typing. Um, what does that mean? Uh, purity is a, a concept much like referential transparency. It means that your computations actually don't have any side effects. So think about your computations as equations, like x equals 5 plus 3, whatever. You're not actually performing any operation in the real world. You can manage effects uh, through different kinds of concepts uh, in, in Haskell and PureScript. Uh, you usually talk about monads. So it's a, it's a sort of a pure way to talk about impure programs. And the type system, which in maybe in your typical uh, programming languages deals with different types of data, strings, integers, booleans, and so on. The type system in the, the programming language that we want to talk about actually are able to reason about these effects as well. So it prevents you from doing things that deals with the real world when you're writing something that is always supposed to compute a value. Um, usually uh, what happens when you have type systems like that is that the compiler needs to get really sophisticated. So uh, we try to use that to our benefit. So the, you have really advanced meta-programming uh, capabilities in the language that we're using. And a lot of the libraries that we've been developing utilize that to a large extent. Um, yeah. So here's the key. Yeah. Um, basically like the kind of things that we're you know contrasting against here are widely popular programming languages like JavaScript or Go. They're kind of like languages that everybody uses in this space. Um, and people seem to be very productive in those things, so if that's your jam then like that's cool. Uh, but you know basically like you can't really make an argument that really either is like a particularly future thinking or innovative programming language. Especially like, you know, people like Go and it's, it seems like lots of programs are successfully written in Go, but for a language that was devised, you know, devised in 2005, knowing, or whatever it was, that knowing everything that we know now, like they've basically just, you know, created Java circa like 1998. So it's like, you can do things in those, you know, that's cool, but there's like a lot of research in programming language theory that enables kinds of Reasons about program, reasoning about programming that we can do now in 2019 that was not possible in 1998, and that's like what we're trying to work on. Um, so because like neither one of these offers much in terms of like safety, so the ability to statically analyze for behavior or performance or possible um, whatever, you know, people focus especially on things like security threats in the space, and all those things are really difficult to these languages. Yeah. Oh, and so. Yeah, basically these are the libraries that we're talking about right today or like <coughs> tomorrow with this other workshop where some of them uh, written a language called 
script, which we'll talk about later. Uh, basically, like the ones that, you know, whatever, there's a Web3 API similar to whatever, you know, JS, Web3, or Java, Web3, or whatever. It has lots of features that those things don't, but that's the kind of like the functionality that it covers. Um, and then Chantrell is like a tool that we have made and has come to kind of like maturity at this point um, that is a smart contract deployed management and testing tool similar to Truffle but without all the you know nonsense. So and I should also mention that like okay then there's also the Haskell libraries which are maintained for this. Uh, we don't maintain this but we're I'm like the largest contributor to that probably at this point and um, we run a fork. Um, it's also worth mentioning that I, we proposed this talk for last year's thing and we were denied because it was considered like fringe or like need to niche or whatever. So I don't know if the standards got lower or the stakes got higher. But, <laughs> like none of these things are new. They've been around for over a year. And just now we got invited to talk. We actually got invited to talk about them instead of denied. Um, and yeah, so the ones that are in uh, gold or whatever, those are things that we actually own. The ones that are purple or are more like gold. This is not super interesting, but just to highlight the point that we actually did all this stuff last year. So this isn't like your new like JS framework of a week or whatever that's going to you know, next week is going to get replaced. That's all I have to say is that these libraries are mature and you can use them, and we can illustrate that in this workshop tomorrow. But this is not like some new thing that doesn't work or whatever. Um, all I want we can just skip this in the interest of time. But basically, all of this work really started in 2017, and more or less like. <clears throat> Except for the you know case of truffle, which happened some period, whatever this like truffle decision to replace it. it was kind of all happening contemporaneously, like with our growth as a company. Like you probably not, maybe you have or haven't heard of Foam as a Ethereum company, but uh, we you know started writing software in 2017, and like basically the, the reason why all this software exists is that we tried to use the off-the-shelf stuff, and I couldn't figure out how to use it, and we're like reasonably smart people, so. All of this started to be developed in order to produce our own products and write our own applications, which today run on mainnet Ethereum, um, it quite, I think quite successfully given the number of people that we actually have working on this kind of stuff. Um, and the fact that we don't have like we have a lot of people complain. We have a lot of users and not a lot of complainers, so I think it works. Um, yeah, I'm just giving us this. So just uh, before we dive into sort of like more technical details of uh, you know how these libraries work, I just wanted to give a little bit of motivation for um, why we think it's important. So uh, Martin showed that we, that we started working on these uh, libraries in 2017 when uh, Foam was new and we started developing what's now called uh, our map. Uh, back then we called the spatial index, and we were faced with. We had a little bit of uh, Haskell blockchain experience and we were faced with having to write a full stack application that's now fairly sophisticated. So imagine kind of like Google Maps or .com or whatever, uh, but running on Ethereum. And so we've had a couple of years and we, we back then decided that like it's worth doing the upfront investment to develop these libraries for the front end side as well as the back end instead of using established technologies. And I guess the, the, the recent uh, for why we're still happy with that and we'd like to invite you to use these tools as well is that um, we, we're basically now a small operation, we're like four or five developers working mostly on other things at this point uh, and we have a basically type safe develop deployment so when we're generating code from uh, you know our, uh, the Solidity code generates all kinds of uh, bindings for both the back end and the front end uh, because we're using these strongly typed languages, these bindings are also have types, right? So that means that the compiler will tell us if we've ch changed something on one end of the stack and the rest of the stack that depends on it hasn't uh, made the uh, reflective changes. And because it's not just like matching word by word or counting number of arguments, it's actually we're able to encode a lot of the actual uh, uh, behavior of those functions, we get uh, a lot of safety when deployed. And so, this, uh, you know, we're not on the camp where we're saying don't write tests anymore, but the types for the compiler when type checking our integration effectively eliminates a whole set of tests. And so this, this has served us really well when we're iterating on this application. Um, another point that I, I don't think we'll get to it to show it here, but one of the really beautiful aspects of the 
Haskell part of this is that our whole API is a type. So the, that means that the compiler, the compiler understands the type, you can reason about it. And so it effectively generates all, well, I should say, most of our bindings, the compiler does that for us. Uh, so that means that we do get, so we expose our production API in terms of this swagger definition, which is like a standard for exposing APIs. We didn't write that. That's generated by the compiler every time we deploy. We use that internally, but uh, other companies use the same swagger definition to integrate with us. So they have the same level of you know, uh, guarantees that we have ourselves. And so uh, recently, um, we've had a couple of uh, sort of uh, great integration happening completely without our help. So no like Telegram uh, you know, help channels or even blog posts really. We're just exposing this API uh, and the generated docs. And so we've had uh, recently uh, an Android application that's paired with Gnosis Safe and uses foam uh, for locating points. Uh, so you need five different points physically to like recover your wallet. Uh, they want some hackathon. There's an upcoming uh, chain link integration that uh, uses cross chains, both mainnet and Coban, and we have sort of written Google Cloud uh, output from our API. And actually part of our whole, we don't have the ability to write applications for every use case, so we actually have a user community that builds applications for us to serve our users. And again, with very little support. So that's kind of why these tools, although they have a hard, uh, large learning uh, threshold, they really pay off once you have them. <coughs> yeah, we can probably skip this. Uh, or whatever, but I will say that like, oh yeah, this is actually kind of relevant for some of the work. So yeah, people, you know, there's like a, you know, Solidity or EVM hangover, and people are kind of like looking at replacements for these things and talking about like WebAssembly, and there are various states of development on those things, you know, like, um, you know, or, or even like in the era of like application-specific blockchains, people are looking at, you know, not even having to worry about that that's entirely, you know, things like, Cosmos Tendermint was saying you can write your application like what you want. But now that you're given like a wide variety of choices, it's kind of like, well, don't make the same mistake twice, basically. So that's all this is really going to talk about. Um, also, there's like probably some confusion because Pure Script is not really a popular language. But if you've heard of Haskell, which a lot of people have heard of it, um, Haskell is kind of like more at this point means like a family of languages than it does even one specific thing. So there are like people talk about a Haskell. It just means like a language which has a similar type system up to a certain point and very similar syntax. Um, so uh, basically, like PureScript is an opinionated dialect of Haskell. It was uh, created the, compi the first compiler was written in 2013. So like to compare with other things that people know about, like TypeScript or Elm, we're in sort of the same like family of functional programming languages, but are, are sorry, not TypeScript, but Elm, uh, but are comparatively much weaker. Um, they're roughly the same age. So this is an, this is also not some like new fad JavaScript framework for this week. And uh, basically, like it's simp the language itself simplifies and distills a lot of concepts from Haskell that were learned over a really long period of time and don't suffer from the kinds of backwards compatibility problems that Haskell has because it's a very old language. So lots of things were like done right and like redone and done right the first time. Um, and it's actually not even really a language itself, it's more like a language specification that supports like multiple backends or runtimes. So like the PureScript language itself is just a language specification, it doesn't specify the runtime behavior, which means that you can technically write bindings to like the PureScript core dump or whatever in any language that you want, and the pop most popular one is JavaScript because it needs to run in the browser. And the reason why is that most of the PureScript core, co core developers were coming from web uh, from like user interface design, and they wanted to write frame, they wanted to write frameworks to write uh, web applications in this language. But so that's why it's the most sophisticated. But there are others. Uh, there's an Erlang one, which I, somehow is the most advanced of them. But there's also the C++, and there's some like experimental work on some one for Go as well. So basically, what this means is that like if you have like a large Go application in the well, not now, but in the future. But today, if you had like a C++ application and you wanted to start offloading some of the core parts of the application to a more uh, type-heavy language, you can write certain parts of this thing in pure script and have it compile and link to a C++ like in a later phase of the tool chain. Um, yeah, I'm actually not sure how we're in this. Oh, I see, because we're at the bottom of this thing. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, no, no, okay. I see how we're, we're like somewhere in like a three-dimensional slideshow right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, so basically like the present day situation is that, like I said, all of these things are mature for working with the standard stack of the Ethereum blockchain and uh, with the Ethereum blockchain and uh, uh, Solidity, uh, or something that produces an ABI of the standard type that most people are used to. Uh, Chantrell itself is, is kind of like married to Solidity at this point because it, it, integrates, <coughs> Sol, it integrates Sol as part of its um, pipeline, build pipeline, but you know, there's other things you can go in directions there that are kind of more, they're newer, they're kind of stable, like stabilizing, but they're not really stable enough for us to really integrate with like this EPM support. Um, which is like Ethereum package manager, kind of like uh, that's kind of on the short list of things to do. But then there's other things like language, other language support, like Viper or um, whatever the one else is more like, you know, formality or whatever the case may be. Anything that generates an API though is in theory a fair game. Um, and then here's like a comparative stack diagram in case none of that makes any sense to you. So basically, like. <coughs> Left hand side, you have like your kind of traditional stack that you know consensus, uh, you know that you kind of like comes from a lot of like the work that consensus did at the beginning, and now is kind of like offshoot shoots to other companies. But you have things like test RPC or like uh, Ganache or uh, <coughs> maybe the same product at this point or Truffle. They may have all been consumed by like one project sitting. Uh, sorry, sorry um, you know, those kinds of like fake Ethereum layers or maybe a real Ethereum layer, you have a Solidity compiler, Web3.js, Truffle, and then you build all of your applications on top of that. And what we're advocating for is more on the right-hand side. So there's like um, Ethereum and Clickbait, which is like our version of some kind of test RPC. It's effectively like a really simplified Docker container that runs a real Ethereum node, but in a timeline that you can expect to run unit tests and stuff against. Um, here's Web3, Solidity compiler, uh, Chantrell, and that is all of your DAP development. So you can, these slides will be published. And you can, you know. So, like, the next part of the talk is basically giving some examples of, of uh, what this stuff looks like. Um, and, you know, the key here is like, for, for us, anyway, it's like, yeah, simplify your life for some definition of the word simplify because there's like a pretty steep learning curve to starting to you know how to do these things. But, you know, at some point your life gets exponentially simpler. It's just, I don't know how long it's going to take for you individually. But um, you kind of like, yeah. Well, basically, like, I just want to talk for a second. Yeah, this is kind of like more in depth of like what we were. This is more like an in depth section of what we were talking about earlier about like some of these core concepts in like functional programming that are illustrated through these libraries. So, again, like, pure, like, there's this notion of purity. It means there's, there's a separate, there's somehow like a separation in the type system between what's called like effectful computation or stuff that has like side effects or might throw exceptions or whatever. Here's a list of some things, you know, like um, like codecs, like coming to and from bytes, you know, or byte strings or whatever has the possibility for like, you know, decoding errors and what happens when you have those to the how far do they bubble up and how much do you handle them. That's the kind of side effect that's like more pure in the sense that it didn't happen because of like a network failure and something that just, you're programmed through an exception in some way, at some point you have to deal with it. Um, throwing other kinds of runtime exceptions or indicating that errors that happened, unrecoverable errors such as like database failures or API call failures, but also, you know, basically like um, improperly formatted data exceptions, etc. Also like invoking a Web3 or another network call, these are all things that we mean by like side effects because you communicate, in that sense you've communicated somehow in the real world, which means you've actually created some side effects such that if you maybe made the same call again, you would get different results depending on what you um, examples of pure functions are like more kind of like, um, you know, they're, they're everywhere, but they're like somehow more difficult to come up with like interesting examples because they're kind of, you know, situation specific. But like data transformations that can't fail, like sorting a list, for example, is a pure computation because there's, there's really nothing, what are you going to, why do you need to ask, you know, the internet how to sort the list? You just like write a sort algorithm and it works. There's no... Unless you ask stack over. <laughs> yeah, there's like, yeah, you... Basically, there's no way that you're going to. There's no way that that can throw an exception. There's no way that that can call cause a network failure. There's no way that that needs to read or write from a disk. The sorting algorithm itself is a, a pure data transformation from a list to a list. That's an example of like a pure function, um, or other like mathematical functions or operations. That just basically stuff that can't possibly fail unless it's implemented wrong. But like, there's no like random reason why it might fail. Um, 
So like here's you know basically like starting to get into like some of the simplest like just as like a you know ground like a, a common framework here like we could talk about you know private public and private keys in Ethereum they use a certain uh, signature schema called you know, ECDSA on this particular curve people who've worked at low enough levels have probably come across this um, a private key uniquely determines a public key in this framework and an address like the typical Ethereum address that we all talk about all the time is basically just like the last 20 bytes of the half of this public key so like this is just a common framework to say that like these are the things that you can actually talk about in these like these are it's probably a bit difficult to see from the back um, so I try to try to keep it here but like anybody you know this is basically like kind of like the parts where you know by the type system by using the type system this way you're basically building a universe of things you can talk about so like there's private keys there's public keys and there's addresses or whatever what are these things at a low level they're like byte strings of course everything at some point is a byte string. But the point is to like basically build up abstractions like you do in every other language so that you know you can't confuse things like public and private keys even though they both refer to byte strings. You're basically trying to like abstract away like the low-level things that we talked about, the high-level things that never make a mistake when you're doing this. Um, and then an address, you know, whatever, it's a hash result. So it could be like a hex, it's usually represented as a hex string or whatever, it's a certain kind of encoded byte string, but it could also be whatever. So like the example of purity, for example, here, like these are kind of boring functions or whatever, but these are examples of pure functions. So these are the highlighted ones. Like basically a way to like unwrap things, so or to you know basically to take a public key and produce a hex string. There's pretty much no way that that can fail because you're taking an hash or something. It's not a computation that fails. You can uh, basically you can ask for like how to get the you know how to make a private uh, sorry a um, or whatever how to how to make a, a public key from a private key. That's something that, again, based on the description that we just gave in the last slide, it's a combination of like hashing and taking slices or whatever. Because you know the hash is a certain size, you know that the slice won't fail. These are pure computations. These are kind of boring, right? Um, these are the ones that are, in some sense, effectful, right? Because like, does every hex string, or does every byte string or hex string or whatever correspond to a public key? Probably not. If it's not 20 bytes long, it doesn't. So there's like a potential to fail here, which is encapsulated in something called like maybe or option type. Maybe more from like Rust or TypeScript or whatever. Um, can you, can anything, can any hex string become a private key? Possibly, I mean, basically any number of things. So, it, but there are cases where this can fail. Can any ad, can any hex string correspond to an address? No, it has to be a certain number of bytes long. Um, here's an example of like, you know, whatever, encoding, you know, what I say like encodings are not, these are like effective, they're not pure. It's because, Basically, like, if you look at this, like, yeah, okay, ABI encoding, like, there's a specification somewhere if you read the docs. How do you talk, how do you encode data that can be read by an Ethereum smart contract? It's through, an, it's through a codex schema called ABI encodings or something, if it has even a name at all. But, you know, basically for any data type that you should be able to communicate across a contract boundary line, there should be a way to turn it into some, like, byte string or some hex string. And similarly, like, if you want to decode, like, a tuple of, you know, a solidity, if you want to decode like a tuple of EVM types, you need some way to parse hex strings into those things. So this is like basically like this is a language specific idea that like you know there's some for some types out there we can encode them and for some types we can decode them. And ideally those are the same, right? If you can encode it, you should be able to decode it. But then like here's this idea of you know like oh, okay we have like a hex string we want to parse it into something that has a particular type and we're making a constraint on this particular type that somewhere you've defined codex for this thing. This still might fail because, like, it doesn't matter that the thing has the decode instance. The problem is, is that the thing that you're, you're you have at hand, this raw byte string, might be coming from somewhere else where you it does, it's not long enough or it doesn't correspond in some way to the thing that you're trying to decode because you made a mistake somewhere. So in this second, this sense, like, this is an impure computation because it might produce the value that you're looking for. It might also produce a parse error instead that should tell you basically. Um, this is just basically saying what I just said. I should probably just do this one. Um, and then, like, usually what we say is, like, uh, this last computation or whatever that takes, it takes a hex string and, and runs it into either something of type parse error or the value you're looking for. It's like, basically, you can, you can think about this to, like, resolve the effects. So at some point, like, all the effects have to come out. At the end of the day, the program has a type, which is IO of unit. Every program has this type in the history of mankind. And at the end of the day, all of your effects have to resolve to some, some basic thing that the program can run it. And as your program evolves, as your program is like 
coming down the way, you're basically constantly resolving effects down to like simpler and simpler things. So at the end of the day, you end up with the, with the one type that programs to be like. So all of these effect systems, like whether it be like a, an error effect system or a network effect system, they all have to resolve at the end of the day. And this is part of like programming the style of many ways choosing where you want to resolve. Um, so how can so basically like you know, as a specific, as a specific example, like, uh, yeah, as a specific example of like, uh, uh, places where this can get interesting is like, okay, yeah, like addresses is an address is an EVM type. You can decode this if you have a, if you have a byte string of a certain length, you can decode it. So basically, like, throw away the first twelve bytes or whatever, take or take the last twenty bytes. And try to uh, basically just figure out if like, you have the right. Um, sorry, if you can make an address from these last 20 bytes, then it should be good. Otherwise, it should fail. I think this last one is maybe even. I don't know. I did these by hand, so this might not even. There's no way that this can fail. Basically, this is basically saying that like take the first 20, take the first 12 bytes, <coughs> take the remaining 20 bytes, and call it an address. And the only way this can fail is if this take fails or this take fails. And what that means is the thing you had it wasn't long enough. That's all this is saying. Okay, cool. So you can decode addresses from types or whatever. That's pretty cool. But like, what if you, you know, to do something that's like a little more complicated, for example, like in, in the EVM, you also have this notion of like sized arrays. So like, you have a pre-sized array, let's say it's like a tuple of addresses, right? Like, event types often correspond like this in some way. Like, for example, everybody's favorite event is probably the transfer event that results in your address getting more money or whatever. And that's effectively like a free tool, right? Of like, well, there's two addresses in there and then there's like a, you know, whatever, like a uint in there somewhere. But in this sense, like, there's like a notion of like, it also makes sense to speak about like a vector of, or like a vector of addresses, which is like a list of addresses of a predefined length. And like, okay, so if you can somehow communicate the predefined length to the program that you're writing, it um, you can basically reason about it and say like, okay, like the only way that this thing can fail in parsing or whatever is if sorry, I'm just down. So if you're looking at like a vector of a predefined length, which is this n here of certain type a, you can decode into this thing. Basically, what you're telling what you're once you can successfully decode into this, what you're telling the program is like, no matter what, at this point, I know that this. Thing here is a like, it's a vector of a certain length. You don't ever have to worry again about like checking the size of this thing. Like you pass it off to a different function, that function also will know the length of this vector because it's encoded in the type system. So if you can build that into like the codex or whatever, basically what it means is that after you're able to decode information from the EVM, you have enough information about this in this particular case, this vector, so that you'll never get an array out of bounds. Except access like its third argument because you know that in order to even try to access the third argument uh, this vector has, a si has to have a size of this three. Like you will get, a, I will show you an example of this, you will get a compile time error if you try to access something which is not there. So rather than like trying to check for this everywhere and trying to throw some exception in case it didn't happen, what you, what's going to end up happening is that like every part of your program will now be a, a, in sync. It will know that this vector has to be. <coughs> It seems like a stupid thing, but then, you know, it is a stupid thing. But then once you realize how to do this, you can do this like more and more and more complicated ways. This is a particular example of what I'm talking about. So like, um, you know, statically sized vectors, if you if you do enough like low level stuff with solidity, you know how these things are encoded or whatever. The first word is like the length of the thing that you're looking at, and this and then it's followed by just the concatenation of all the arguments. So I can have this like this is a you know you can't read this in the back probably but this is just the number two followed by two addresses and you'd like to parse this into a vector of length two this is like some type level language that's very specific to like the library that we use but basically what this is going to do is try to turn this hex string into either a parse error or a vector of length two of type address and after that uh, and after that forever like. You can't, for example, in this, um, you can't fail in this last case when you try to take the first, when you try to take the first uh, coordinate of this array, you will never fail. So, can I just say, yeah. So maybe the intuition here is a little bit like, so when you're typically in like an imperative language or languages, less uh, a sophisticated type language, 
every kind of operation you end up doing on something important, you'll have like a lot of if statements. And they kind of like all end up at the same place because you're doing something you can't rely on whatever was coming before, carry the certainty of that information at that point in your code. Whereas like typically by composing a lot of interactions in which the, the, the guarantees of the data is encoded in a type this way, you basically don't see any of these if statements or assertions in your code itself. They're all packed into the type and then there's sort of the corresponding parser or whatever it is converted for it. Yeah. So when you're looking at a, a, a actual application code, you don't see any of these like, oh, let me just make sure right here that I didn't like mess up. It's all gone. And it's in this in these sort of like places instead. So that's kind of maybe the intuition. Uh, yeah, totally. Um, and then, you know, for going back to the effectful system for like network computation, so we previously covered just things that are like basically handling errors or exceptions or whatever. What you know, if you're able to encapsulate like network calls, particularly in, in the context of Ethereum or whatever, inside of this effect system. What it kind of guarantees is that like you can't take for granted that if you run you know a computation in one place that you would get the same results as if you tried to run it in a different place. So what it's saying is that like you know where you where you call where you make effect, where you make effectful calls can change the code that comes after it. And so you can't just like make them wherever you want. You need to have them sequenced in a certain way. If you don't, you will get a type error. Your, your program will never run because it can't be compiled. So for example, like whatever. Um, there's like this web3 effect, which is in this library, which manages all of the effectful computations that you can run against an Ethereum node. And there is a really, really big difference between a value of type A and a value of type web3 of A. And basically, like, understanding this difference, or at least getting used to it, is kind of the basis for everything that happens here. So I can't tell you how to understand it, but I can tell you that if you understand the difference between having a value of type address and having a value of, a value of type web3 of address, these are very, very different things. I can't explain it to you, all I can do is show you examples. Um, this is an example which unfortunately is going to be really hard to read for those in the back, but um, here's an example from a test suite or whatever. So here I have in highlighted, so here I have highlighted all of the pure computations here, which are effectively a series of let bindings. So basically like variable bindings and making uh, size integers and things, uh, these are the things which I would say are not effectful. Um, and then actually, for example, this is a setup, this, for context, this is a setup to basically an ERC-20 token call. Um, here is like the effectual computations are highlighted here, basically it's a, tra it's a transfer. So when you want to transfer tokens, that is an effect. When you do that, if, whether it succeeds or fails, the world is forever changed because you've made a network call, you've caused some other thing outside of your program to react. Um, and then basically what I'm saying here is that like in order to run the in order to run the effects, or in order to get the thing that you're looking for, which is effectively like a, at the end of this computation is like a, um, a, a, the result of causing this transfer event to happen is usually produced in terms of like events or whatever. This here is, is another effect. Like these things, this has to happen before this can happen. Yeah, so maybe just, so here, we're, we're telling the compiler that this uh, transfer action lives in Web3. We don't know what that's gonna look like because it lives in the, the other world. The only way we can sort of look into it is to run a cert Web3. This is sort of like a run that we have to yeah. do. Yeah, this is how you like resolve the effects to something lower level than you can deal with. So like, I'm happy to talk to anybody who or asking questions about this, but it's it's kind of like saying that like um, you have to. There are certain places where you're allowed to you know uh, bind a variable to the result of an effect, and it can't be just like in a simple assertion statement like <coughs> here, where I bind like the recipient of this token is going to be the null address. That's cool. I can do that because there's no effect. There's no effect there. But at some point, if I wanted to like take the result of this transfer, like the data about <coughs> to from an amount, and bind that to a variable to use for later computation. I have to do that inside of some of the effects. But when you're saying that the assert web three like actually caused it to happen, is that strict over there, or is it still? Is it, will it still be like lazy there, and it will be something down the line will force the computation? Well, so this, the yeah. Way. So in this language, uh, like pure script is strict, which means that like oh. all these things will happen immediately. But in Haskell, this this would look identical the syntax and everything. All of the, the yeah, in that case, actually, you have some notions in, in 
in statically type functional programming world, there are some notions about when computations run. It's part of the runtime that's built for the language itself, and that can you're still guaranteed that they're going to happen in order, but yeah, like in what in what time will it take? It depends on the thing. Um, so basically, like yeah, this you can go through these slides, you, you know, and ask yourself these questions like which you know continues from this previous slide, like which part of this computation is pure, which are effectful, uh, which parts can be throwing an exception, which parts can be throwing null pointer exceptions. There are none because they don't exist in those languages. But which parts can fail, which parts can't fail, this, these become basically like self-evident from the code itself. And so rather than like skimming through line by line and inserting a bunch of print statements for things to figure out like when something's going to fail, I can look at this program. Sorry, I'm keys um, I can look at this program in advance and tell that uh, this line could fail because it has an it has an effective computation. It might be tripped up by a network error. This is a variable binding that caused that basically whose result is an effectual computation you could run later. There's nothing being run here. It's just setting it up. So there's nothing that can fail here. There's nothing that can fail in any of these lead pipes. So if this if this test fails because of an effectual reason, I know it has to take place in this line. There's no possible way that it can do anything else. So it just I don't know. In that sense, like how you start to look at projects, large large bodies of code where many things are happening. It's very important to basically be able to look at, at looking at only this this particular block. I can tell that the only way that this can fail is this one this one part here. Um, so what do you gain? The analogy here is that like whatever like the you know the, you know the code is to the program is like the types are to the meta program, which is to say that like the compiler is taking in the types that you're giving to. The, 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 the program that you're writing, whether you like it or not, is, is creating, it's typed. Like the language, you don't have to always write it yourself, but you don't always have to annotate it and say that this thing has type. Whatever, the program, the compiler is able to figure out a lot of that for you. But the, by typing the language itself, the compiler is able to operate on your, uh, on your types and to produce like certain guarantees for certain things in the same way that your program can operate on values. So, in the same way that your program manipulates values, the, the compiler here is like basically reading in types and, and reasoning about those things in the same way that you reason about Boolean logic or whatever it is that your program does. And the more accurate and expressive that your types are, the more work the compiler can do for you for free. So for example, like the more accurate that your types are for saying like when things can throw exceptions and when they can't, when they might fail and when they might not, the compiler is able to basically like tell you more and more about the possible places where your program is maybe incorrectly written or where it might fail. The downside of this is that this kind of programming is really hard, but it's different than it's different than being really hard to get right. It's really hard to learn, but once you learn how to do it, there is not really uh, it's the kind of thing that you can't. It's very difficult to implement a program improperly in these languages. Like you have these kind of people who talk about Haskell, especially like oh the first time I wrote Haskell. Program. By the time I figured out how to get it to a pile, like a few months later, it just worked the first time. There was no like, there was no unit test. It just worked. It's because like it's actually somewhat. While it's somewhat difficult to express programs in these languages, there is it's difficult to get a program to compile that doesn't do the thing you think it's going to. And when it does, it's something actually. It's it's, it's interesting because you've somehow like done in some sense like what's supposed to be impossible. So the interesting. You know, parts of this library, which I would tout or whatever, is like whatever. Like the way that it does, you know, the way that it does parsing and what in ABI, you know, basically dealing with like encoding and decoding stuff is like pretty cool and proof and concise. It's like easy to prove that all that stuff is correct. So I didn't spend six months writing tests for this stuff. I spent like a month writing it, and then it just kind of like works. And there's not really a, the way that it's implemented. It's not really difficult to tell. The the thing which I would say here is like the most interesting thing. Is probably the way that it does like trans yeah, so there's like a meme here for but whatever. The thing I would say here that's probably the most interesting feature that this has that does not exist in your vanilla 0.3 JS library or whatever is something that's just called um, like the multi-filtering or something, which is like basically a way to consume Ethereum logs in a particular order that you want to specify. And I just the left with the remaining time before we have a few questions or whatever, I would just specify like what that means. So 
The theory of logs, if you don't know, are basically the way that it's a me mechanism for applications to create updates to contract states. So when, when contracts change, uh, you don't always know unless there's an event that gets fired that would tell you to go back and basically look at it or possibly just consume the, the log itself to get all the information you want to know. And these are consumed by some kind of like something called a filter, like a Web3 filter. It's a diagram about how this works. Uh, it took me forever to make. And so like the problem statement for like this multi-filter thing, for example, is like you want to listen to like you want to listen to multiple events, each one of them coming from one of several different contracts. This is very uh, common because you have multiple, you know, to separate concerns, you write multiple different contracts. You don't have just one giant contract. Each one of these things is submitting different kinds of events from different addresses, and you want to define specific handlers that run against each event type. This is, um, you know, most common in some cases when you're just trying to store them in some kind of cache layer, but it also might, you know, whatever, it might update a UI or something else. Um, and every time that you, you, you want to run each handler over its event in the event that that uh, in the event, in the event that those events were logged by the EDM, so like in chronological order. So like contracts, you know, calling, if I have one contract that emits an event and it's very, before its return statement, it makes a call somewhere in its body, uh, which causes another event to fire, then like I want to resolve these things in the order that they came out in basically like a block. And so the use case for this, which we have, which probably lots of other people have, is that um, you're building a cache for contract state, which is updated or revalidated whenever certain events fire. So um, because you want to you want to use as your backend, you want to use like a relational database, but um, you know you don't want to use like the EVM as your backend or whatever. So you might want to fill up some cache for your application. If there are dependencies in your events, for example, like an NFT market contract, there's like a token listed for sale event that indicates that, like oh there's a new token I can buy, but that token itself refers to a token ID. And that token ID is, you would only know that that token existed if um, the event that like meant new token event from the NFT contract itself had fired in some case. So like, there's kind of like a result, resolving of actions that spawn things to happen, but in order to make sense of one action, I might have to know that, oh, this token was meant in a different location. And the reason why is that, you know, in a relational database, for example, you have things like foreign key constraints that say that like this token for sale this token for sale is a row in some database, and that row has a column called token ID, and that token ID is pointing to a token table somewhere else. And if that token is not in that token table, then this schema has now been invalidated, because I can't talk about a token for sale unless I know about the token. So basically, like, you have created a situation in which you have you know, foreign key constraints in a relational database that you cannot, uh, you cannot maintain unless things are processed in an order to keep those foreign key relations sound. And so this is particularly useful if you want to not run against like a full archive node where, so like if you want to run a full, yeah, that's not a big problem if you, if you have a full archive node, cool. You can do whatever contract lookups at whatever point in time you want. For example, if I have like two different event processors, one catching all the tokens that were ever minted, one catching all of the tokens that were listed for sale, if I don't have a full archive node, whenever I get this token listed for sale event, I better have already received this, this like token minted event, or else I can guarantee that when I like look up stuff, that things are going to resolve. I were out of time, or I would talk more about this because it's an interesting problem that has all kinds of things that will come up tomorrow in this talk we're giving tomorrow. But that's how I'll leave it for now. And then the last case is, you know, we're not time to talk about this, but if you want to talk about Cosmos and Haskell, you can talk to me. That's it.